Hello everyone, I'm the Saxy Gamer. Today we're here for yet another episode of Civilization 6 Tips, where today we are going to be talking about how to be successful with your early wars. And early wars are something that are very important in Civ 6, just because of how good land is in Civ 6. Because more land means more cities, which means more districts, which means more yields. And really, all of Civ 6 pretty much revolves around districts, so having more land for more districts means that you are going to be much better off in the game than other people. Also, of course, if you're able to eliminate your nearest neighbor, that's just one less person that you have to compete with in the game, and thus that puts you even farther ahead. So to start right off, one of the things that we're going to talk about is how to decide if you should go about with early war. And this is something that I find that I normally decide within the first 10 or so turns. One of the big things, that, like the biggest things that influences whether or not I want to go at war early on is how close I am to the nearest person. So you can see in this game, Scotland is very close to me. Their capital is right here, mine's right here. So that's probably within what? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's within seven tiles. So this for me is way too close because Scotland and I will probably be competing for a lot of this land. And that's something that I generally don't want to do. So to solve that problem, I'm just going to kill them. And <laughs> as goofy as that sounds, that is honestly probably one of the best ways to deal with this issue is to simply kill whoever is going to be completing with, uh, competing with the land for you. Because then you take their land and you secure all of this land for yourself and you're not pressured to push out out settlers as fast as you possibly can. In general, I would say that if somebody's capital is within 10 tiles of yours, then I would consider going for an early war. If you haven't met anybody in like by turn 15 and there's very evidently not anybody near you, I wouldn't really worry about early war too much. City-states are something that I would consider it, you know, to be just up to your own judgment as to whether or not you want to go with uh, what you want to go to war with them very early on. If they're close to you, that might not be a problem because obviously city-states aren't going to expand, but that could be a good city spot that you want to take. So if you find that the city spots or the city-states are in a very good location for a city, then I would go ahead and take them as long as they're not one of the best city-states in the game that have really good suzerain bonuses like Hattusa or Auckland or something of the sort. So once you decide that you do indeed want to go to early war, then there is a, there is a slight bit of preparation that you have to go about, and this is where a lot of people tend to dis disagree on what you want to do. So. I personally believe that the thing that you should do to prepare for early war is to simply spam out melee units. It's a big debate in Civ as to whether or not melee units or ranged unit spam is better for taking things, and I'm 99% certain that melee units are undoubtedly better than ranged units for sieging. There are a number of reasons for this. So for one, it in general takes a lot fewer hits from your melee units to capture cities or to take and or to kill enemy units. And this is a very important thing because this relates to war weariness. So war weariness in Civ 6 is applied based on how many engagements are, are occurring during the war. So if you have, say, five ranged units that take 15 hits to get a city down to like one HP and then you kill it with a melee unit, then you're going to get so much war weariness. If you have five melee units that take, say, five hits to take that city, then you're going to get one-third of the war weariness that you would have gotten from your uh, ranged units. So that is one reason. Another reason is that early on, the earliest ranged unit that you get is the Slinger, and the Slinger only has a range of one, so it's just absolutely terrible for going to war early game, because you're going to have to get within melee range of things anyways, and it's probably going to get killed if you fight melee units with Slingers. If you do have archers unlocked, I do think it is useful to have at least one or two archers with your melee army, just because archers can be very useful for dealing with enemy troops that are around your melee units, and your archers can protect them while they are attacking the city, so that way they don't die. Aside from that, though, I would undoubtedly say that melee units are your way to go. I would definitely go with warriors. If you have horsemen, then horsemen are easily one of the best units in the early game for declaring war because they have high movement, they have high combat strength, and they generally just stomp everything. They also do ignore zone of control, which is something that we'll talk about in a little bit. And zone of control is another one of those things that just makes melee units better than ranged units. And once again, that's something that we will talk about in a little bit. So say that you've decided that you're going to go for an early war and you've started spamming out your melee units, I would generally advise that you get at least four warriors before you declare war. I would generally at least go for five or six, but four is enough to probably get the job done. You might have a, a bit of an issue if the enemy has a large army. I can't really tell if Scotland has a large army or not in this game, but they very well may. So as you can see here, I'm still just producing more Eagle Warriors. 
If you're not playing a civilization that has a very good, unique early unit, like Montezuma or Gilgamesh or, you know, somebody like that that has those the Eagle Warriors and the War Cards, then I would still go with a fairly normal build order very early on in the game. So still build a scout, maybe get down a second city, maybe build a builder, maybe get a slinger just for defense, um, and then start rushing your melee units. But if you are playing a civilization that has a really good early unit like Montezuma or Gilgamesh, then just spam those units out as fast as you can and make use of them while you can. So once you decide that you're going to go to war and you have your units, I generally find that it is a good idea to start surrounding the city before you actually declare war. So getting your units around like this can make your siege a lot more effective because it's going to be a lot more efficient because once you declare war, you can just move in and put the city under siege. And putting the city under siege is easily probably the single most important thing for capturing cities with melee units in Civ 6, um, especially in the early game, but not honestly not just in the early game, throughout the entire game. And we'll talk about that in just a few seconds right after we talk about a the best pantheon for um, declaring early war. So if you're able to get to a pantheon, I would 100% recommend going God of the Forge because God of the Forge gives you a ton of production towards your ancient and classical era military units. So if you're able to get God of the Forge, definitely get that if you're planning on early war. Okay, so now you can see here that all of our units are pretty much in position because now we can all just move in in a single turn and surround the city and put it under siege. So we're going to go ahead and declare war. It really doesn't matter in the early game if you declare war if you're, or if you go for either of these Casas Belli, just because the warmongering penalties, as you can see right now, are none anyways. So it's not like it's going to make any sort of difference as to whether you declare formal war or surprise war. And now that we've declared war, we're just going to go ahead and move our units in. And now let's go ahead and talk about zone of control and how to put a city under siege. So putting a city under siege makes it so that that city will not regenerate health at the end of every single turn. And to get zone of or to get the city under siege, what you have to do is gain zone of control over every single tile around that city. So zone of control is something that is exerted by all units except for your civilian units, so like your settlers and your builders, ranged units, siege units, and support units. So that means all of your melee units are going to exert it, all of your cavalry units are going to exert it, and that's part of what makes it so good. So zone of control is exerted by these units on all tiles around them and the tile that they are standing on. What zone of control does is it makes it so that if a unit moves into that tile, they cannot move out of it in that same turn. The only thing that they can do is defend or they can attack the unit. The next turn they are free to move out of it, but during that turn they cannot move out of it. And this is exerted, as I mentioned, on all tiles around your melee units. And once you gain zone of control over all tiles around a city, that city will be put under siege. One thing to note is that it is, not, it, is, it is not exerted over rivers, so that's why I have to have this unit over here, because this river's here. So to gain zone of control of this tile, I do have to make sure that I have a unit on that tile. That's also why this city is not under siege yet, because since this guy is on... Like this Eagle Warrior right here is on the other side of the river from this tile. Nobody has zone of control of this tile because it's on the other side of the river from both this Eagle Warrior and this one. So if we move him on here, you'll see that now the city is under siege and it will not regenerate once we hit it. And now the strategy really is just to start whittling down the city with your melee units. So this is something that is a little bit difficult to do depending on how many uh, units your, your opponent has. So you can see that he has a warrior in the city and he also has a warrior outside. So one of these two units is probably going to be attacked by this warrior. But it's really not that big of a deal because none of them are low enough to, um, to be killed at this current moment. So you can see with melee units we can take his capital in probably two turns which is incredibly fast. Um, this guy right here, since I'm not really using him to attack the city right now, I'm going to use him to take out the, the, uh, some of Scotland's units that may attack some of my seizures. So if you do have extra units that aren't really specifically attacking the city, then you can go ahead and use them to just take out, uh, the, the other units that might attack some of the guys that are attacking your, your, uh, the guys that are sieging. Another thing that you can do with these extra guys is once once one of these units gets low, you can then swap them out and then have this guy attack the city while this one heals. But since none of these guys are really low, I'm just going to have him attack and kill this scout. And we got a builder from it just because we are Montezuma and we have Eagle Warriors. Also, my trader has nowhere to go. So you can see that in this turn, we have 
easily enough strength to go ahead and take his capital. So that was a two-turn, two-turn capital take. Um, and that is why melee units are so good, because they can take cities extremely fast, which also plays into loyalty as well, because being able to take cities fast means that you can get multiple cities around the ones that you're capturing. So multiple cities means more loyalty exerted by, uh, lo loyalty pressure for you exerted by the population. And if they're close together like this and you're able to take them real fast, then you probably won't have any issues with loyalty. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about right here is unit promotions. So the first unit promotions generally come pretty fast. If you're in three engagements, then your unit will earn a promotion. And both of these promotions are fairly decent. I think Battle Cry is pretty much unanimously better, just because for the most part in the early game, you're going to be fighting melee units like other warriors. So Battle Cry is very useful for that. The other useful promotions that can be a very big game changer in the early game is to use the promotions to heal your units. So promotions will provide your units with an additional 50 HP, or I guess not really an additional, but it will heal them 50 hit points whenever you gain the promotion. So one thing that you might want to consider doing is saving your promotions until your units absolutely need the health from them, and then you can promote them. This is something that is a little bit risky to do. If you're a very experienced player, then it is something that you can do. If you're feeling confident enough that that unit is not going to die that turn, then you can save the promotion until he's very low. You can hit a huge power spike by giving him more combat strength and health, and then you can destroy whoever is trying to attack him. But once again, that's something that if you're an experienced player, that might be a thing to do. But if you're not very experienced, then I would just go ahead and promote the units as soon as you get the promotions. And you can see that he has healed up to full now. And we can go ahead and take this city. So just like that, two turns and his capital is totally gone. Now, in general, I do find that especially early on, it is the best thing that you can do is send all of your units to attack one city at a time. I know some people like to go and attack multiple cities at a time to kind of spread out and distract their opponents, so that way their opponents have to spread out their units as well to defend. But I generally find, especially with the melee strategy, that it is much better to just go and like overwhelm one city at a time. So from here, I could go and attack one of these other cities. Another thing to consider in the early game is whether or not you want to keep a city or raise it. So you can see that his capital right here, it's in a pretty good spot. It's got some pretty good tile yields around it. It has some luxuries. It's got this mountain here and it's on fresh water. So this city is one that is probably worth keeping. This one down here though, maybe not just because the AI in Civ 6 is very stupid and sometimes they settle not on fresh water. So this city, I'm going to have to build an aqueduct in it if I want to get better housing. So it honestly might be worthwhile if I take this city, it might be more worthwhile to raise it and then settle another city that is close enough, you know, like in that relative range that is actually on fresh water. So that is something that uh, that you should consider in the early game. Once you get late into the game and the cities are built up, then I would advise against raising them just because it's going to take so long to get them to the point where they have all the stuff that's already been built them again or that's that's been built in them again that it's generally not worth it from a time standpoint. But early on in the game, whenever you have plenty of time left, then I do think that it is a very good consideration to consider raising raising cities and resettling in the relative locations in better spots. Um, as far as other useful units in the early game are concerned, the really big one is the Battering Ram, which is unlocked with Masonry, which also happens to be when you unlock Ancient Walls. So, Battering Rams are incredibly strong for dealing with walls because they make it so that your melee units do full damage to city walls. And this generally means that you can take down the walls with one or like probably two or three melee attacks, which can normally happen in a single turn. So, Battering Rams are very good if you see that someone is building walls. Um, you can generally avoid doing these if you're very early, early on in the game because people probably won't have walls up this early on in the game. If you see that someone is building walls though, and if they're building walls, you'll see that there's a little outline of the walls around their, uh, around their city. If you see that they are building walls, then generally I would advise that you prepare a battering ram in advance because if those walls come up halfway through your siege, then you could be in a lot of trouble. So just being careful to make sure that you have a battering ram in the event that walls are being built, or obviously if they are, if they are already built, then I would go ahead and construct the battering ram. One of the other things that I would like to talk about is whether or not you should continue going with a war early on after you take a city. So 
one of the big considerations is, okay, so you, you know, I've taken their capital. Do I want to keep going and take these cities as well, or should I just stop here and, you know, just start building up my own empire rather than trying to take down theirs? And this is definitely a matter of personal preference, and it's very situational because in certain situations, the, really the big gauge that I would say to go for as to whether or not you want to keep going or stop is, well, how many resources are you putting in to keep this siege going? So with these warriors here, I could probably take both of these cities without having to put in any more resources. So if that's the case, then I would say, yeah, go ahead and keep sieging. If you find that you have to expend a lot of resources to keep going, so maybe you're losing a lot of units, you have to keep producing them in your capital and the cities that you're taking, then I would say no, it's probably not a good idea to keep going because you're, and you're going to end up putting yourself behind because your cities are going to be very weak, you're not really going to be able to keep those units if they're dying, and you're just going to be spending a lot of resources to take a little bit more land, which is generally a not very wise investment. But in a game like this where I very easily took his capital and I could probably very easily take these cities, I probably don't even have to keep making military units in these two cities, I would say that it is a very good idea to keep going. The other thing that might uh, determine as to whether or not you want to keep going is whether or not loyalty is an issue. So if the city that you take is losing loyalty and maybe there's like, you know, say it's losing loyalty and it's going to rebel in 10 turns, then I would say yes, definitely keep going because being able to capture a second city is going to help out the loyalty in this city a lot. Um, another way that you can help mend that loyalty is if you get a governor. So some of the early civics that give governor titles include early empire and state workforce. So if you find that you really need loyalty, then I would go for one of these two and you can appoint a governor and put them in the city. I don't really find that it matters which governor. I mean, some of the governors have really good starting bonuses, but a lot of people think, oh, if I'm going early domination, then I should get Victor. But really, that's not really the case, because Victor is good for defense and not much else. So just still go with whatever governor you would normally pick. I normally tend to pick Magnus or Liang. But either way, all of the governors provide an equal amount of loyalty to the city once they are positioned there. Another way to help with loyalty if you're having issues is to make sure that your capital grows. So if you haven't watched my loyalty in depth video, go ahead and check it out. But the population of your capital is very crucial towards exerting a lot of loyalty pressure in the early game. So making sure that your capital is growing and has a decent amount of population can help make it so that these cities that are a little bit farther away might not struggle with loyalty as much. This does mean that you probably shouldn't build too many settlers if you're going for early domination because settlers in your capital are going to decrease its population and thus decrease the amount of loyalty pressure that is exerted. The exception there would be that if the cities that you're taking are really far away and you want to go settle near them so that way you have another city that's exerting pressure, then that would be a case in which you would want to build a settler. But for the most part, just try to keep your, uh, your, your uh, capital's population as high as you possibly can while you're going for early war. And if you follow most of those tips, you know, like pretty pretty strictly, then you should find that hopefully your early wars are going a lot more successfully. The really big one and the one that I want to stress the most is just the fact of zone of control and, and uh, putting the city under siege. Because I think that that is the single most important thing in the early game for declaring early war and for making your early wars successful. So thank you everyone for watching, I have been the Saxy Gamer. if you enjoyed the video feel free to like, if not feel free to dislike. If you're looking for more Civilization 6 content feel free to subscribe, if you have any questions feel free to put them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.